Well, hi, everybody. I'm Brian Shore, and I'm the director of Anderson Ranch Editions. Thank you. It, it's my great pleasure to welcome you here. Um, we're thrilled to have Deborah Anzinger here on campus as a visiting artist. And she's kicking off our fall lecture series, which runs weekly through mid-December. Please check out the schedule online and uh, join us for more wonderful talks this fall. And I also want to welcome our online audience. For those of us who are here in Shermer, let's all please silence our cell phones before this begins. Thank you. And also Anderson Ranch would like to acknowledge that our campus resides on the traditional ancestral territory of the Ute people who called the Roaring Fork Valley and beyond home for over 800 years. Through our mission to promote a wide range of arts, cultures, and voices, we commit to partner with and honor the indigenous ancestors and residents of this sacred land where we learn, work, and create. Deborah Anzinger is an artist who works in painting, sculpture, video, and sound to integrate and reconfigure aesthetic syntax that relates us to land, gender, and race bodies. She is also the founder of the New Local Space, NLS, in Kingston, Jamaica. Uh, Anzinger's work was the subject of a solo exhibition at the Institute of Contemporary Art the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. Um, and she has been included in institutional exhibitions such as Perez Art Museum Miami, the Museum of Contemporary African Diasporan Art in Brooklyn, the National Art Gallery of the Bahamas, National Gallery of Jamaica, and Kent State University Museum in Ohio. Her work is published in Small Axe Journal, a Duke University Press publication, Caribbean Quarterly, published by Taylor and Francis, Bomb Magazine, Art Papers, The New Yorker, and Art Forum. Ann Singer was the recipient of a Pollock Krasner Foundation grant and a fellowship to Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture, and she is the 2020 Soros Art Fellow. So please, everyone, join me in welcoming Deborah Ann Singer. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Thank you, everybody, for being here. <clears throat> Thank you to the Anderson Ranch Arts Center for hosting me as part of this lecture series. <clears throat> I'm going to spend some time speaking about my studio practice, but also a wider community practice. Brian <clears throat> mentioned a little bit about new local space. So I think we can start the video now, Kevin. I'll begin with a short excerpt from the story, Mayal. Bear with me, I'm going to try and weave a few different things together. Um, the story is written by novelist Erna Broadbur, who also hosts an annual convening called Black Space in Woodside, St. Mary, Jamaica, which I had the pleasure of attending this year on the invitation of her sister and fellow writer Velma Pollard and her niece, Tanit Broadbur. I'm going to start the, the excerpt now. <clears throat> Long conversations between herself took place in her head, mostly accusations. He took everything I had away, made what he wanted of it, and gave me back nothing. It was you who let him take everything. You gave him everything. But I didn't even know when I was giving it that it was mine and my everything. How could you not have known? Mule, with blinders on. You wouldn't listen. You wouldn't see. That's a monologue where Ella, the main, one of the main characters, has suffered a breakdown, a splitting of herself. Mile is also the same novel that the quote that was on the screen initially is from. On one level, the story tells, the novel tells the story of a community dealing with two cases of spirit thievery being experienced by two young women in their rural community in a small town in Jamaica. One theft being by an unsuspected black male elder who in spirit has crept into the bed of young Anita in a desperate attempt to regain his virility. The other instance is by the white American husband of Ella, who she's taken from Jamaica to meet in the US, away from her black farm worker mother, where she now passes for white and serves as a muse for her white American husband's minstrel shows. 
On another level, Mayal tells the story of the subversive, largely unseen, unspoken, but retained ancestral ways that a marginal community led by Miss Gata, who Broadbury describes in the story as a systemic force, a coconut tree in a private hurricane. The, how this community reorganizes itself, for itself the relationship between race, gender, and class that have been imposed on it from slavery. And it's this unspoken retention that I posit is a type of marinage. The passage I just read, Ella's monologue, speaks to the economy of life and how imperial, colonial, extractive social constructs organize that economy and even become internalized which is the point of departure for my work as an artist. While Wilson Harris, whose review you saw an image of earlier, himself is a writer of black and indigenous reorganization through magical realism in post-independence Guyana, stated in the review that he wrote of Erna Broadbaugh's work, is it not possible to see Ella, Ella's monologue <clears throat> resonating in a first, is it not possible to see Ella as the victim of an enlightenment that has long concentrated in the humanities on patterns of behaviorism as a logical field in itself? For me, though, Ella's monologue resonates in a first-hand way, lived reality. I responded when I, re when I read it viscerally as if it was a memory of a conversation I once had with myself, a voyage of the psyche, as Harris puts it. That same economy of life that precipitates Ella's breakdown is what black geographer Daniel Purifoy gets at directly in her essay for Birthing from the Bottom, her essay Birthing from the Bottom, which she contributed to the catalog of the solar show at ICA in Philadelphia. Purifoy states, the bottom is the entanglement of black peoples with the extraction and commodification of nature for the development of wealth and power, for the sustaining of white dominated political space. Per Charles Mills, the Jamaican-American political philosopher, the black peoples and spaces constituting the bottom are construed as the morally debased and waste-producing parts of the body politic. In other words, as a wilderness to be acted upon by civilized white space. Black people under this white imaginary are thus part of an undifferentiated, extractable resource. Such is the character of the continuing plantation economy, per Jamaican economist George Beckford the replication of colonialism and its ecology onto contemporary landscapes through new configurations of resource extraction and wealth production, through isolating consolidated power and wealth so far from the sites of production and reality that its holders believe they can survive without the bottom, indeed without a functioning planet. Purifoy lays it out in the essay. The conditions generated by these configurations indicate with some certainty that this system cannot continue. When it crumbles, what will emerge? The constitutive subordination and thingification of black peoples and natures requires not only a re-articulation of black liberation, but also a major change in the characterization and valuation of natures. The bottom, Daniel Purifoy tells us, in black feminist tradition, is a space where possibility exists for true revolutionary loving liberation. My work as an artist concerns itself with its re-characterization and this revaluation of nature as Purifoy writes of, in an evolving material experimentation to develop a syntax that, th that centers and shifts the ways that black female embodiment is paralleled with the land. <coughs> Excuse me. Shifting this value through aesthetics and praxis driven by the question, what are the ways for this revaluation to feed back in a life-giving way to the local reality of the fertile, fecund wilderness situated at the bottom, ecologically, socioeconomically, and spiritually. Growing up in Kingston, Jamaica, my particular upbringing carried very little value in the social framework that determined worth. And that social value system was, and in some ways, still is governed by Christianity, economic status, class inheritances of the political party system, and remnants of plantation society, in a society that was in many ways aspiring to be post-black. We existed within none of these terms. So through my work, it, it became appealing to fathom ways to unguard and untether the ways we organize social identifiers and the ways we privilege particular subjectivities. Ultimately for me, that's a question of liberation and the complexity of this notion of liberation liberation inside us, but also between us, between us and the environments we inhabit, 
which necessarily involves not only notions of race and gender, but other social signifiers and geographies that we exist within. Our rules for organizing ourselves and each other in space might be inherited through hegemony, but there are also subversive inheritances that I'm trying to tap into with my work as an artist. I've been inspired by moments that this subversiveness has played out historically in Jamaica, but also in surrealist literature and black feminist thought from the Caribbean and from the continuum, continuum of black diaspora linkages, including but not limited to Erna Bradba, Wilson Harris, Sylvia Winter, Audre Lorde, Octavia Butler, Bell Hooks, and in the tradition of surrealism and in the tradition of, of black feminist thought, I'm, I'm interested in disarming the present configurations of value. This is simultaneously a destructive exercise as well as a generative one as, as referenced in Daniel Purifoy's essay. <clears throat> Abstraction as a mode of working has been useful for me in these terms. If agency and power are hinged on how often and when we can deny or say no, then through abstraction I can modulate how much is denied and how much is given of the body of the subject in the work. What may you consume as the viewer and what may you not, even as erotic potential is at play. The materials and the marks that I'm making assert with them the presence of a particular subjectivity and embodied state and particular gender traits, it asserts the erotic, but it also refuses consumption of the body. I found it generative to bring this subjectivity into the work through a loaded phenotype, pheno, phenotypic trait um, rather than through figuration. Afro kinky hair specifically. In terms of materials, I've included mirrors often Mirrors are a device to, and I'm just scrolling through images, so you'll probably be, be able to make the connection, but if not, you can ask me in the questions. Um, mirrors are a device to bring the viewer into the work, reflected and framed as marks, suspended temporarily from their current contextual configurations, and inserted into a system of organizations that they, the viewer, may not understand or recognize. The loaded meanings and values of the particular phenotypes I refer to in the work, but also the living plants that exist in the plane of the work are brought to the fore when confronted alongside the reflection of the self. Non-human species, in particular plant life, become part of the relation to otherness. In this body of work, um, which spans from about 2017 to 2019, um, I'm mostly working in paint and ceramics and introducing other elements. I love painting more than the tradition of the medium. I love experimenting with the mark making. I love working with clay as a means of mark making, but also as a way to think about what a vessel means, what a vessel can carry. And there's an informality to thinking about ideas and methods that I'm bringing to the work, I think comes from accessing a lot of my education, my art education through informal means. Um, maybe a lack of reverence for boundaries that is coming from a formal, edu a formal education across multiple fields. Though I did study art growing up, my undergrad concentration was in plant physiology, my PhD is in microbiology. Um, it was really educational for me to spend um, time across disciplines, time working for a nonprofit art gallery in DC after graduation. And um, I think yeah, it's pretty clear my interest in plants has continued. I'm an avid gardener, I'm a farmer too. I'm a mother, a lot of the imagery in my work toggles between fertility, um, reproductive work, reproductive labor, and maybe most importantly, play. Play and humor are driving forces that, um, that fuel most of my work and help me to conceive some of these configurations and more serious ideas for how I involve myself with organizing materials and how I work with people. Um, and of course, a conversation about labor <clears throat> is inevitably a political conversation about access to play and enjoyment. So I think it's part of the equation of activating what liberation might be to invoke this kind of play in the work. It not, it's not just mark making and sort of semiotic sorting, but also working out a palette system that is centered in play for me. And all of these works are using a synthetic pal palette to reference nature's, again, blurring the lines that way also. 
Let me see what is coming up here. I'm not exactly following. Okay. Yeah, so these works, um, Growth Index, the smaller works to the left, um, are titled Growth Index. And there are a series of small-scale um, acrylic on paper paintings made in 2019. And um, th this is an installation view of the exhibition at ICA. Uh, the title plays with the language, growth index as a title plays with the language used to describe, you know, the appreciation of stocks, um, while also thinking about the idea of growth as it relates to hair. So the hair and its presence expanding within this framework. I do like to play with the titles of, of my work, and the titles for me are an extension of the, the way that the work operates. So if you are looking at some of the earlier slides, like um, a title like Fiction as a Vessel for Reality, um, An Unlikely Birth, which as a work was preceded by a work titled Before You Realized You Could Be Seen, I Watched You Soak soaked in the shade while I was conceiving. There was an earlier ceramic work titled I, which is actually a sculpture of a tongue through an orifice. And then there was an earlier um, painting on canvas titled Garden, which was a canvas of repeating phallic motifs. So <clears throat> working on a smaller scale for growth index, I, it was fun. I, was, I started working out more simplified visual language um, which was an exercise that I found challenging, as I was discussing with Ryan, humbling. Um, you know, I felt like I had to pay attention to what was needed, what's, what, what's, what's superfluous, what's needed, what don't I actually need. And I really got into that, and I loved it. So, um, yeah, so aesthetics for me is a means of play thinking through systems of um, liberation in a in a in a, in a two-dimensional way that um, I guess also becomes a point of departure for me to move beyond the limitations of art and symbolism. <clears throat> so I'm using a lot of imagery. I'm distilling distilling the imagery down. Um, you know, how can, how, what's, the, what's the minimum amount of gestures that I'd need to portray something like water, um, uh, liquid, land mass, the body. <clears throat> this might be the last one. Um, in this exhibition, uh, there, I, we had a multimedia installation um, that really marked the point of departure for me um, of moving beyond symbolism. Maybe I didn't realize it at the time, but that's definitely what it was. <clears throat> it was a one installation of a one-room vernacular architectural structure, familiar in Jamaica and across the global south, and it was visually at odds with the wider exhibition in the, in that space. And the structure housed living plants and grow lights. The grow lights were powered by the visitors pedaling the generator in there. And I'm going to go ahead and play the video um, that these two visitors inside of the space were watching while they were pedaling. I should play in another second or so. And these were native plants to Philadelphia that we brought into the space. And these are all recycled materials. You know, the water is good when we have it, so. Just seeing the state of certain Having that major drought experience. Uh, it was, was this 2014 or 15? There was a time when I mean, for months, the water scarcity was major. And you heard it uptown and downtown. You know, people, people who had means were able to buy water. And the people without means 
my god, I don't know how they were managing.
Okay, <clears throat> thinking on from that work, <clears throat> I we just sort of overlaid the video with the installation because I, it's kind of hard to show the video without thinking about the wider installation. But thinking on from that work about feeding this fertile wilderness that Purify references in her essay, I started working on an institu sculpture project in Maroon Town, St. James in Jamaica, called Training Stations, last year through the Soros Arts Fellowship and later as part of the UPenn Just Futures Initiative on historical family land that my great grandparents bought at about the time Africans could begin legally legally owning, owning land in Jamaica. The space carries that family history, but it also carries a history tied to emancipation from slavery. The environs of Maroon Town is where many Africans escaped to and hid from West Coast plantations. It's where battles of the Maroon Wars between runaway Africans and colonial British forces were fought and won by Africans. And it's where the infamous Maroon Peace Treaty was signed, granting full autonomy to the cockpit country from the British Constitution in 1738. Today, the cockpit country is a target for mining. So training stations involves an effort to archive, reforest, and make space for forms of ancestral knowledge through sculpture and craft. It involves an effort to relate to natures in equitable and ecologically generative ways. Um, and there are some guiding questions or guiding organizational principles um, that I posited to myself. Um, if the relationships, if the relationships to racialized gendered bodies and to land are based in access, penetration, ownership, and control, then can I work within relationships that enact respect for opacity? and inhospitality. If the relationships are based in extraction from these bodies and land, can, can we shift that to relationships based in sustained care? If the relationships are based in productivity of these bodies to be consumed, then can we shift that to relationships that allow for contemplation and innate value? And if the relationships to land and body are based in ahistoricization and erasure, can they be shifted to ones of cultivation in which we not only historicize ourselves for ourselves through archiving and transfer, but also for the earth, along the earth, the whole, the ecology that sustains us. So working towards reforestation, I had to learn about how the land had changed and the new challenges that this presented and responding in a way that, that in, in the way that we replanted <clears throat> so far. We planted more than 300 trees, um, including cashew, avocado, blue maho, mahogany, cedar, pimento. And it was important for us to mark the space. And in the spirit of shifting values, we, we, we wanted to, and in, in the spirit of shifting values and the way that we attribute um, different kinds of knowledge with different kinds of value, we, we wanted to build a, a monument towards what we we're doing that would allow for us to relearn lost ancestral knowledge and information. And so the project involved creating a monument from the earth and grass um, that, that could also mark an interior space for, for listening and sharing. <clears throat> so we've, ex we've experimented in carrying out workshops aimed at passing on some of the knowledge that we've, um, that we've relearned um, in traditional technology, technologies <clears throat> regained through the fellowship project. And I just wanted to acknowledge that the sculpture was built with the immense help of Owen Brooks, Warren Welsh, Lisi Dehaney, Ricardo Gordon, Keen Coke, Tino Trelevon, Sutania Drummonds, Delroy Sakes, Charles Nugent, and James E. Wright, who all live in, in Maroon Town. So the project also had me thinking more intently on what responsibility of access looks like around documentation and label. And that's, that's something that I continue to process and to think about iteratively. I think there are a few more images of the sculpture that we can just look through. Um, yeah, and so the, it's, the sculpture is literally made from the land that it exists on. And this is one of the 
small workshops that we held. And, um, oh, right, one of the plants that we planted was a, a tropical variety of blackberry, which is doing really well there. And a lot of the, a lot of the um, trees that we planted were now just getting to the point where they're, we're a little bit less worried about them. So <clears throat> just getting past the baby phase. Um, yeah. And then to the blackberry vine just kind of taking over some of the bamboo there. So I think it's going to come very shortly to um, the current work. Oh, that's more, more images of the land. Vervain. Pineapple. Yam. OK, yes. Um, so circling back to this image of current work, I'm, I'm working on a body of paintings right now um, with cook shop charcoal, which is an essential but undervalued and loosely protected natural resource in Jamaica right now that a lot of the, the um, a lot of people who manufacture it are coming under, um, I guess, heavy criticism of, but it's an essential form of fuel for people who don't have stoves. Um, <clears throat> again, I'm thinking about physically shifting how we see the value of a resource. How does our value for charcoal transform with a change in perspective from seeing it as an essential fuel for survival in local marginal economies to now seeing it as a luxury consumer product whose value is tied to parameters far removed from the local realities of black communities in the global south? But most importantly um, for me, what is the potential of that value shift to feed back and feed that feedback into that fecund wilderness? Again, these works are an, an exercise for me in simple forms. Okay, all right, so let's shift modes a bit and think thinking more broadly about working way in ways to create tangible value shifts that feed back into the local socioeconomic reality and the kinds of environments that we create for ourselves in a life-giving way through our practices. A few years after completing grad school, I moved back home to Kingston where I started new local space. And the structure of NLS came to be really largely in response to the realities of being an artist in Jamaica. There was, there was no public funding you could apply to, um, no art residency programs, any type of incubatory support was missing. So in terms of our programming structure, we then offered art residencies, curatorial fellowships, a podcast program, an exhibition program, an internship program, and low cost studio space. So. For the individual residences, um, NLS provides a 300,000 Jamaican dollar work stipend, which used to be 3,000 US dollars, but now it's more like 2,000 US dollars um, because of the rapid um, inflation. 24 hour access to private studio space for 10 to 12 weeks and professional studio visits and a solo exhibition. The curatorial and art writing fellowship follows a similar model with a work stipend, but includes a committee of mentors who offer guidance on methods, methods, inquiry, and practical concerns with exhibition planning and logistics. And the podcast program works in tandem with the residences and fellowships and is a way for us to extend the conversations happening to a wider public. So through working with NLS, there are a number of important art practices we've been lucky enough to encounter and help support Sasha K. Hines' work, which is what's, what we're looking at now, is, um, is one of those practices. And with each residency or fellowship, the, the, the fellowship project, the issue of equity always comes up in some ways. And Sasha K., um, maybe we can pause right here, Kevin. Sasha K.'s work, um, Sasha K. works through performance, video, and photography, moving from interrogating her own experience with teenage pregnancy to exploring broader themes of failure and pain in relationships 
as well as importantly, attending quest for joy and freedom. And in her own words, she draws from the insecurity of intimate narratives, complicating notions of self-identity and intersectional feminism, embracing mystery, solitude, and what she calls sass, to propose layered and complicated notions of beauty. And importantly, her work also shines a light on the lack of legislative support for child protection, reproductive rights, and victims of abuse in Jamaica. I think we can resume the video now. And then Joni Gordon, who is, uh, was a recent artist in residence, um, her work deconstructed her experience as an immigrant worker in the US State Department's summer work and travel program, which recruits tertiary students from low and middle income countries to work for minimum wage in the US. And the program, and, and ironically, you have to pay to be a part of the program. And the program describes itself as a means for cultural exchange and financial empowerment to afford education in a student's home countries. And through her work, Joni provides a counter narrative of debt, exploitation, and discrimination that un underpins the programs, and fleshing out the link between geopolitical power, racial discrimination, and the realities of individuals in the global South and personal trauma. So the diversity of art practices and experiences means that we are continue, continually collectively rolling this issue of equity around and seeing it from a number of different positionalities, looking at the challenges and the ways forward. So responsibility, the way I see it is that responsibility for and accountability to each other has helped us to facilitate this and is built into the model of the residencies and the fellowships. So because of the lack of infrastructure for artists after, leave art, after they leave art school, a lot of what we do involves developing and implementing pedagogical approaches for professional knowledge and critical discourses. So we had so many artists who I'm immensely grateful to, who we collectively are grateful to, who have helped us with this kind of work. And keeping a library of publications and art books is also part of this pedagogy and also part of our efforts to build um, some kind of archive. Um, yeah, and these are just a few of the artist books and, um, and donations to the library and acquisitions to the library that we've been able to make throughout the years and um, some of the other art practices that we've been able to support. Onika Russell, Michaela Garrick, Oh, well, I'll end on these images of the studio here at Anderson Ranch to say thank you to you all for coming to this talk and, um, and to say thank you to the staff here who've all been so knowledgeable and helpful, um, Joanne and Jules, um, for helping me with the, some of this. Clay, Brian, Emil, Meriwether for facilitating, Josh and the amazing kitchen staff. Um, Peter for the warm welcome and the wonderful residents who are here at the same time as I am, who I've had the pleasure of, I've had the pleasure of meeting and sharing meals with. So yeah, thank you. Any questions? Okay. Yeah, I could repeat the questions if you, because I can hear them. Well, if anyone, oh, there we go. Um, if anyone has any question, please raise your hand. We prefer if you um, speak through the microphone so those watching can hear the question. And no pressure if there are no questions. No pressure. Hi, can you talk a little bit more about the hair you're using as an element in your pieces? Like, is it natural hair? Is it synthetic? Are you synthetic. gathering it from somewhere in particular? Because it's important. Yeah, it's, and that's a really good question. It's synthetic. And at one point, I was thinking of using natural real hair. And then I thought it's a common trait in and of itself to use a synthetic hair because I mean, up until very recently, that kind of hair would not even be found in a beauty supply store. 
right? Like the fact that I can actually buy it means that it's worth something now. And I think that that in and of itself is information about like embedded information about like even the shifts in like value and um, worth. Any other questions? No? Thank you for that question, Amethyst. Deborah, I, I'm just curious if you can say something about the what seems to me like such a close relationship between sort of your own, I mean, if if we can call it that, like your own personal work and what seems to me very community-oriented practice overall with all the different kinds of work you do. Yeah. Um, well, I think that even though they are different and they are separate, that there really is, that the boundary is, uh, I mean, they're all interconnected. Even though they're, they're distinct, they're also interconnected. So I guess I'm thinking I can't help but think of systems. So even if I have a studio practice and, my, and the studio practice is, you know, is thriving, I'm still located within a specific wider space. Like, what, how is what I'm doing actually um, relating to that, to, this, to the wider space? I just don't think that there is any way for me to see things as um, not affecting each other. So even though they might be distinct from each other, that, that there's no way that what we're doing isn't going to affect, some, affect the wider ecosystem around us, the wider environment. And I guess it was in that spirit that I founded NLS because I relocated my studio from DC to Kingston. And of course, I still had all the connections and relationships I still ha um, that I forged while I was in the US. But I did notice that you know, visiting with artists. Everything just seemed really quiet in Kingston. And I knew that there, there were so many artists working there. And I was like, why is everything so quiet? And it was really, you know, you, you don't, you make assumptions and then your assumptions are incorrect. And then you, you, you kind of, I think you just have to be humble enough to accept that your assumptions could be incorrect. And one of the things that I realized was really, it was just this lack of incubatory space outside of art school where people just did not have a space to kind of convene. Um, so there were practices, but the, but people were giving up even that there was such a high rate of attrition. There still is a pretty high rate of attrition, but we've seen it go down. So once you leave art school, then you, you're faced with the realities of life. You have, you have debts, loans to pay back, you, um, and by the way, art school there, you, people here would just be like, that costs nothing. But they have, people have loans to pay back. Then before you know it, they're working at a bank. They're living, they're living with, with, with um, not in independent situations. And so you have to face this, reality, this harsh, harsh reality that, um, yeah, this dream or this idea of being an artist is going to come secondary to like, the, the reality of survival. So, um, so yeah, so I figured if, if there was a way that I could contribute to that. I mean, NLS started off as a little garage space. So when we were doing our little, pro when we were doing our little programs and people would come and be like, we heard about this space and they come like, this is it? That's it? It was really just like a little garage and we just said, here's the garage, you can have the garage. And this is, I mean, we changed it into a white box. I, um, you know, I used what little money I had and changed the garage into this white uh, uh, project space, a clean project space. And so artists would come in and they would just use that space for like for the 10 weeks. And we just find whatever money that we could and, and, and contribute that as a work stipend. And then before we knew it, I mean, I had got enough momentum that art students just started applying to come to that little space that people were kind of just turning their nose up at, at first. But then we grew, we got more funding, and then we expanded the space a little bit, and now we're able to do more. So that's, that's kind of how it's worked, just very organically and just seeing the interconnection of things, even if my studio practice is 
separate. I don't see NLS as an extension of my studio practice. And um, one of the things that we're really, um, that, I'm, that we really ensure is that when artists have that space, that really just is all their space and they can just um, do whatever they want to do in the space. But we do ask for like a level of accountability. Um, so, you know, when you have your studio visit, your public open studio, uh, that you show up to the public open studio. So um, those kinds of things. Uh, and But we just keep it to that very basic thing. And yeah, and it's just worked. Somehow worked. Thank you. You directed to where I was thinking, which is a little bit about, you know, we met you through sort of a network of, of people who are doing this sort of amazing things. You're supporting that network in Kingston. I was a little curious about your feelings about residencies. I know you were at Skookegan lately. You're spending this time at the ranch. It's a chance to meet people. How does that play into your practice and how would you encourage other, others to think about supporting, participating in, and, and that sort of engagement between the personal practice and community? And even, you know, I, I think you, you moved towards some of those issues of economics and having that space and that ability and those debts. But there's also that idea of, of where we're pushing boundaries and where you're going with your artwork and intellectually and that connection that I think is really fascinating. So I think uh, you got there with Brian's question, but maybe I'll push a little farther um, in where does that network work and how do you see it? And then how do you encourage other people to start building those networks? Mm. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's a good question as well. Uh, and thank you, Brian, for your question. Um, so yeah, that is, there are certain things that I guess, yeah, we're pedagogically sort of trying to infiltrate into the students and the past graduates, which is that you don't, you, you, don't, you are not an island. And yeah, we do try to, so just like, what are you going to do now that you've gotten this opportunity and we've helped you get into graduate school, fully funded, um, you have this solo show, you have, there are things that don't, just leave and not turn back. Because that's part of the issue too, is that once, and it's something that I'm continually concerned about, is that yes, we pull this network together and this network is definitely what helps to facilitate artists um, from the global south, a place in the global south like Jamaica where you know there are issues of mobility, real issues of mobility. I mean, those are just the very basic um, barriers to equity, right? The, the lack of mobility, I mean, lack of funding. I mean, you can't even get a visa to travel right now. So a lot of what we do is bringing people to artists and then somehow that creates enough equity that artists are able to, to speak about their work um, in ways that will allow them to get the funding and whatever that they need. But that then when they go there, they make sure that they help to open doors for younger artists who are coming up behind them or and also like what other look at how NLS started I think a lot of us are also forgetting now um, where NLS started and I try to encourage artists that you really actually don't need much just look at what resources however humble those resources are and see what you can do with them collectively and to the benefit of of your of, of your community and um, yeah, you saw um, Simone Lee, Lorna Simpson, we've also had Nari Ward. Um, but I think, yeah, the main thing, as you said, that connects a lot of the people who work with NLS is this strong sense of existing within a system and how are they actually going to help feed that system. And also just an awareness of some of these issues of access and equity that may not be so obvious. You know, I... I, I, oh, and I actually, you spoke about Skowhegan, but um, Andrea and I, and I were at McDowell earlier this year. And yeah, you know, doing residences is so formative in terms of having space away from like your everyday life. And even though we're like right in the heart of Kingston, I try to create that kind of space for artists, a space where they feel that, it's, it's, it's a safe space. Um, it's a safe space um, socially. It's a safe space in that they don't have to worry about funds while they're there. Um, 
but also um, how can they access other residencies after they've left NLS and done the NLS residency? Um, that's important. So that's something that, that I continually prepare artists to do, to apply to, because they don't, I mean, many artists don't even know about these residencies across the globe that are so formative and important. So yeah, we we actually even hold workshops on how to um, speak about your work, how to write about your work, really, really application, application workshops. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Any other questions? much. Thank you. Please feel free to join us for dinner um, if you'd like to join. <laughs>